Dr. Sage here. Today, we're going to discuss the first part of chapter 14. Chapter 14 talks about genetics, and specifically talks about a type of genetics known as Mendelian genetics. This is the genetics as Gregor Mendel, who is an Austrian monk, discovered it. Now, when Mendel was doing his genetics experiments, what he used as his model organism was a garden pea plant. Now, it turns out the garden pea plant is a great model organism to use to study genetics for several different reasons. First, there are many varieties with distinct heritable features or characters, such as flower color, and character variants, such as purple flowers or white flowers, which are called traits. All right, one thing to note about Mendel is Mendel was alive before it had yet been discovered that the genetic information is carried from one generation to the next through the chromosomes, in particular through the DNA within the chromosomes. That had not been discovered. So because of this, some of the words that Mendel used are a little different than the words that we use nowadays. For example, what Mendel called a character, we now call a gene, and what Mendel called a trait, we now call an allele. So a character is the same thing as a gene, and a trait is the same thing as an allele. Okay, so another advantage of using the garden pea plant is that you can control the mating between pea plants. A lot of people are unaware of this, but plants do mate sexually. They produce sperm and eggs, and you can control that mating. All right, so let me explain how that works to you. This is essentially what Mendel was doing. Mendel, for example, had a pea plant that had purple flowers and a pea plant that had white flowers. And Mendel wanted to understand the pattern of inheritance or the genetics of these pea plants. For example, if he mated the purple flower plant to white flower plant, what types of kids would they have? Would the plants that come from those plants have all purple flowers? Or would they have all white flowers? Or would they have some purple flowers and some white flowers? Or would they have a pale purple color, kind of like a blending of the two colors? Or would they have white flower plants with some purple splotches on it? So this is what Mendel wanted to understand. Now, how Mendel did the experiment is he simply took a paintbrush, and then using the paintbrush, he took pollen from one plant and transferred that pollen onto another plant. All right, now of note, the reason that Mendel is transferring pollen from one plant to another plant is because it turns out that the pollen of plants contains plant sperm. So for any of you out there that have a pollen allergy, what you really have is a plant STD. <laughs> yes, I did add a laugh track to my own video. Why? Well, due to the social isolation because of the coronavirus, I'm bored out of my mind. Got to find some way to entertain myself. All right, back to Mendel. All right, so Mendel transferred the pollen or sperm from one plant onto another. That sperm would fertilize the eggs, which would develop into the embryo, which is the peas. And then those peas would grow up into the next generation, another pea plant. And then through this experiment, Mendel tried to understand the pattern of inheritance or genetics of these pea plants. Now of note, the flowers of pea plants can produce both sperm and eggs. Mendel wanted to be sure that these baby pea plants that were produced were from these two mating together, not from this pea plant mating with itself. So, in order to do that, what he first did is he cut off the organs that produced the pollen on this plant, so this plant could not self-fertilize or mate with itself. So if it did produce peas, those peas had to be generated from the sperm coming from this plant combined with the eggs with this plant. All right, so more details about Mendel's experiment. Mendel chose to track only those characters that occur in two distinct alternative forms. In other words, in pea plants, you have either pea plants with purple flowers or pea plants with white flowers. There are no yellow, blue, red, orange flowered pea plants. It's either purple or white. That's it. He also chose to use varieties that were true breeding. What that means is this purple flower plant, it can mate with itself since it produces both sperm and eggs. If this pea plant is allowed to mate with itself, then the only possible pea plant that it can make is a purple flowered pea plant. It will never make a white flower pea plant. So it's true breeding for the purple flower color. And this white flower pea plant, if you allow it to mate with itself, can only ever make white flower plants. It can never make a purple flower plant. Okay, so you started with those true breeding plants. In a typical experiment, Mendel made it two contrasting, so two different, for example, one purple, one white, True breeding, one was true breeding purple, one was true breeding white. This is a process called hybridization. All right, now when you're doing genetics, you go through several generations of crosses, and there's a nomenclature or a naming system that goes along with that. All right, for example, let's say I have pea plant A, 
and I'm going to mate that, that's what the cross sign means, with P plant B. Okay? This mating we would call the P generation. P stands for parental, so these are the parents. So plant A mates with plant B, and that cre creates plant C. Now, Mendel didn't stop there. He had these C plants, and he allowed them to self-fertilize or mate with each other. Okay, so brothers are mating with sisters, but it's plants, so it's not totally nasty. <laughs> that then creates what's called the F1 generation. F1 stands for first filial. Okay, just remember that it's the kids of the P generation. He allows the F1 generation to self-fertilize or mate with itself, and that's going to create, let's say, plant D. Okay, that would then be called the F2 generation. F2 again stands for second filial, but again, just know it's the plants of the F1 generation. So make sure you know this nomenclature. The P generation are the parents. They create the F1 generation. The F1 are allowed to mate with each other to create the F2 generation. All right, so here's an example of Mendel's experiments. Mendel took a true breeding purple flower plant and made it to a true breeding white flower plant because he wanted to understand what the kid's going to look like. That would be the P generation. When Mendel did this experiment, it turned out that every single flower that he got in the F1 generation had purple flower color. There wasn't any white flower color plants in that F1 generation. Also of note, this purple flower color looked exactly the same as this purple flower color. Okay, it's not like it was a blending of the two colors. He didn't get a uh, like a pale purple flower color. It's not like if you take purple colored paint and white colored paint and mix them together, you'll get pale purple. That's not what he saw. The two purples looked exactly the same. All right, given this result, Mendel came up with some nomenclature, some naming system to go along with them. Okay, the trait, or what we now call allele, that shows up in the F1 generation, in this case, the purple flower color, he called that the dominant trait. Okay. It's not exactly how it works, but think of it like dominator overriding the other color. So that's why it's called the dominant. And then the trait, or what we call allele, that disappears in the F1 that you don't see in the F1, <clears throat> in this case, the white flower color, he called that the recessive. Okay, so dominant is what shows up in the F1. Recessive is what disappears in the F1. All right, Mendel didn't stop there. He then allowed these, this F1 generation, these purple flower plants, to either self-fertilize or to mate with each other, and that would then create the F2 generation. Now, when he did this in the F2 generation, he got both purple flower plants and white flower plants. Okay, so the first thing that told him is that the factor that was affecting the white flower color, it wasn't eliminated or destroyed. Because although you can't see it in the F1, it shows back up in the F2. So what that means is somehow it must be in the F1, but you can't see it. Because it does reappear back in the F2. Okay, the other thing to note is that every time he did this experiment, he always got about a 3 to 1 ratio of the dominant to the recessive. So purple flowers to white flowers. Okay, now I'm going to build up to explain why he got that ratio. It's going to take me a few minutes, though. So for right now, we're just noticing the pattern of inheritance. The P generation creates in the F1. In the F1, you have 100% of the dominant trait, none of the recessive. In the F2, you have a 3 to 1 ratio of dominant to recessive. Okay, so the next thing that Mendel wanted to determine is this pattern of inheritance that he's seen. 100% dominant in the F1, a 3 to 1 ratio of dominant to recessive in the F2, is that pattern of inheritance specific to flower color, or is it more general? Would it apply to any character, or what we now call any gene that he observed? So Mendel didn't stop with just flower color. What he did is he looked at seven different characters or genes in the pea plants. So what color are the flowers, purple versus white? Where do the flowers grow, axially versus terminally? What color are the pea plants, yellow versus green? What shape are the peas, round versus wrinkled? What shape are the pea pods, inflated versus constricted? What color are the pea pods, green versus yellow? And is it a tall plant or a dwarf plant? 
So it turns out for all seven characters of genes that you looked at, only one of them, the dominant allele or trait, showed up in the F1. There wasn't any of the recessive allele or trait in the F1. And for all seven, he got about a three to one ratio of dominant to recessive in the F2. So what this demonstrated to Mendel is that the pattern of adherence that he was observing was not specific to flower color. It turned out he saw the same pattern of inheritance for every character or every gene that he happened to look at. So Mendel developed a hypothesis to explain the three to one inheritance pattern they observed in the F2 offspring. Now there are four concepts that make up these model. And although Mendel did not know about chromosomes, now that we understand chromosomes and meiosis that you learned about for the last exam, it makes perfect sense the results that Mendel obtained. So although Mendel didn't understand that the genes were passed from one generation to the next through the chromosomes, I'm going to talk about chromosomes because it will more easily help us understand his results. All right, first, alternative versions of genes account for variations in inherited characters. For example, the gene for flower, color, and pea plants exists in two versions, one for purple flowers and one for white flowers. These alternative versions of a gene are now called alleles, and each gene resides at a specific locus on a specific chromosome. So, for example, just as in humans, the garden pea plant has two of each type of chromosome. So let's say this is chromosome number one. I'm making that up. I don't know what chromosome it is. But let's say this is chromosome one the pea plant got from its mother and chromosome one the pea plant got from its father. Now because you have two copies of every chromosome, recall what that means is you have two copies of every gene. So there's two copies of the flower color gene in this pea plant. Now, since you have two copies, you could have two of the same alleles. So you could have a purple allele and a purple allele, or a white allele and a white allele, or you can have two different versions. You could have a purple and a white, as is depicted in this figure. Second, for each character, an organism inherits two alleles, one from each parent. All right, now you understand that because we already have learned about meiosis. You understand that you have two of every chromosome. The reason you have two of every chromosome is because one of each type of chromosome came from the sperm cell that made you from your dad, and one of each chromosome came from the egg cell that made you from your mom. So you have one maternal chromosome and one paternal chromosome for each type of chromosome. Now, Mendel didn't know about chromosomes. He didn't know the genetic information was passed from one generation to the next through the chromosomes, through the gametes. However, because of the results he obtained, he said, this must be what's happening. You must have two copies of every character. One copy must come from the mother and one copy must come from the father. I don't know how, but this is what must be happening. Now, as I mentioned, you can have two of the same copy. Like you can have a purple flower allele and a purple flower allele. And that actually explains the true breeding purple flower plants that Mendel started with. The reason that these pea plants were true breeding for purple is because they only had the purple flower color allele. Since they didn't have a version of the white flower color allele, it was impossible for them to make white flowers. So that's over the true breeding purple. Similarly, the true breeding white flower plant, the reason it was true breeding is because the two copies of the flower color gene were both the white allele. Since it didn't have a purple flower color allele, it couldn't make purple flowers. Okay, so that explains why these plants are true breeding for purple and true breeding for white. Third, if two alleles at a locus differ, then one, the dominant allele determines the organism's appearance, and the other, the recessive allele, has no noticeable effect on appearance. In the flower color example, the F1 plants had purple flowers because the allele for that trait is dominant. So, for example, if you have a plant that has a purple flower allele and a white flower allele, since the purple flower allele is dominant, this plant will have purple flowers. Now you do have a copy of the white flower allele, but it has no noticeable effect on the appearance of those flowers. Fourth, now known as law of segregation, the two alleles for heritable characters separate or segregate during gamete formation and end up in different gametes. Thus an egg or sperm gets only one of the two alleles that are present in the organism. This segregation of alleles corresponds to the distribution of homologous chromosomes to different gametes in meiosis. 
Okay, so this directly applies to what we learned about in the last chapter, which was meiosis. We learned that we have two copies of every chromosome, like one that came from a father and one that came from a mother. Now let's say we have two different versions of some gene on that chromosome. Like let's say we have a yellow allele and an orange allele. Now recall before meiosis starts, you have S phase of interphase. You go from unduplicated chromosomes to duplicated chromosomes. Then you do meiosis one. During meiosis one, you separate these homologous chromosomes into two separate cells. Then you do meiosis two. That's when you separate the sister chromatids and create the gametes, which are either sperm cells or egg cells. Now when this happens, each gamete only has one copy of each chromosome, remember they're haploid, and because of that they can only have one version of the allele. So you can have either gametes with the yellow allele or gametes with the orange allele. So a metal segregation model accounts for the 3 to 1 ratio observed in the F2 generation of his numerous crosses. So I'm going to build up to explain the results metal got and why he got them. And frankly, the easiest way to understand and solve most genetics problems is by using something called a Punnett square. However, before I can explain to a Punnett square, I first need to explain to you something about genetics nomenclature, the way we write things in genetics. Okay, so in genetics, we want to have a simpler way of writing things rather than writing out like purple flower allele, white flower allele, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to use an abbreviation. We're going to use a letter to represent the flower color gene. For example, let's say we use the letter P, like P for purple. But there are two different versions of that gene. Remember, you have the purple flower allele and the white flower allele. Now, what we are not going to do is we are not going to use P for purple and W for white. You can't do that because it is actually the same gene. It's just two different versions of the same gene. So we actually need to use the same letter for that gene. So let's say we use a letter P, but there are two different versions. Okay, in genetics, when you are talking about the dominant allele, it's gonna be a capitalized letter. So uppercase P would represent the purple allele. And when you're talking about the recessive allele, it's gonna be a lowercase letter. So little P would represent the white allele. Okay, so uppercase P is the dominant purple allele, lowercase p is the white recessive allele. Now, recall that every plant has two copies of every gene. So for example, in Mendel's P generation, I'm sorry to use the letter P again, but in his P generation, he started with a true breeding purple flowered plant. Now, since it was a purple flowered plant, it's going to have the dominant capital P. And since it's true breeding, what that means is both copies of that gene are the dominant capital P. So that's the true breeding purple flower plant. Now Mendel's going to mate that with the true breeding white flower plant. Okay, white flowers are recessive, so we're going to use lowercase p, okay, for the white flower plant. And since it was true breeding for white, both copies of the gene are going to be the recessive lowercase p. All right, so that would be Mendel's P generation. The true breeding purple is going to mate with a true breeding white, and that's going to create the F1 generation. Now, the easiest way to figure out what the F1 generation are going to be, let's pretend even if you can, let's pretend you can't do it in your heads. The easiest way to figure it out is to do something called a Punnett square. Now, there are different types of Punnett squares, okay, but the simplest type of Punnett square is something called a four square Punnett square. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with a square with four squares inside it. Okay, so that's my four square Punnett square. So that's the first step. Now the second step is to put outside the Punnett square at the top and on the left the possible gametes from the two parents. So let's say that this is a plant that we're going to get the pollen or the sperm from. So that's the father plant. Okay, now he has two copies of this gene, they both happen to be of the purple allele, because remember he's a diploid organism, and he's going to make his gamete the sperm cell, and remember that's going to be haploid. Now when he makes a gamete, that means he's going to give either this uppercase P to his gamete, or he's going to give this uppercase P to his gamete. So the way we write that is the possible gametes he can make is a gamete with an uppercase P, or a gamete with an uppercase P. Okay, they both happen to be uppercase P, but those are two possible gametes he can make. Now let's say this is one the eggs are coming from, so this is the mother. She's again a diploid. She has two copies of the gene. Okay, she's true breeding for white, so both copies of the recessive white allele or the lowercase p. 
when she makes her gamete, which is the egg cell, she's going to go from diploid to haploid. So it's from two copies of the gene to one copy of the gene. So that means she's going to pass on either this lowercase p, okay, or this lowercase p to her gametes. All right, so that would be the second step. You put outside of the square the possible gametes from the father, possible gametes from the mother. The general nomenclature is you put the possible gametes from the father, the sperm cell at the top, possible gametes from the mother, the eggs on the left. Okay, the next and final step is to fill in the square. You're going to put inside the squares what is outside of that square. So, for example, this square here, what we have outside of it is an uppercase P and a lowercase p. This square we have outside of it is an uppercase p and a lowercase p. This square we have outside of it is an uppercase p and a lowercase p. This square we have outside of it is an uppercase p and a lowercase p. Okay, so what's inside the Punnett square, those are the possible progeny or kids from this generation. So what's inside this Punnett square is the F1 generation. Now recall when Mendel does his experiment, in the F1 generation, 100% of the flowers have purple flower color. Now, if you have at least one uppercase P, then you're going to have purple flower color. So this P plant, since it has at least one uppercase P, it's going to have purple flower color. This one is as a big P, so it's going to have purple flower color. This is a big P, so it's going to have purple flower color. This is a big P, so it's also going to have purple flower color. So the reason that Mendel saw 100% of the F1 have purple flower color is because every possible kid has at least one dominant uppercase P, and therefore it's going to have purple flower color. All right, so inside the exponent square, that's the F1 generation. So the F1 is uppercase P and lowercase P. But recall, Mendel didn't stop there. He allowed these P plants to mate with each other. So this one is going to mate with this one, or big P, little P is going to mate with big P, little P. Okay, They're going to mate together, and they're going to create the F2 generation. Now again, in order to figure out what the F2 generation is going to be, the easiest way to do that is to do a Punnett square. So again, I'm going to draw a four square Punnett square. Okay, now this time, on the outside of the Punnett square, are going to be these two parents. So this parent can give either a big P or a little p to their gametes. So I'm going to put big P and little p. This one can give either big P or little p, so again I'm going to put big P and little p. Okay, so again, you fill in the Punnett square just like you did before. So this one, what's outside of this square, is big P and big P. Outside of this square is big P and little p. Outside of this square is big P from here and little p from here. And outside of this square is little p and little p. Okay, so to have purple flower color, you need to have at least one big P. So this is two big P's, therefore it's going to have purple flower color. This has at least one big P, so it's going to have purple flower color. This one has at least one big P, so it's going to have purple flower color. This one, however, does not have a big P, it has two little P's. So that one's going to have white flower color. Okay, so that explains why Mendel always saw a three to one ratio of dominant to recessive in his F2 generation because these three have purple flowers and this one has white flowers. Okay, so that explains his 3 to 1 ratio and then inside this Punnett square that would be the F2 generation. So in the F2 generation he has big P, big P plants and he has big P, little P plants and he has little P little pea plants. Or, here's presented in a much prettier version than what I just drew out. But, in the end, he ended up getting a 3 to 1 ratio of dominant to recessive in his F2 generation, and you can determine that by doing a Punnett square.
Now, the next thing to note when it comes to genetic nomenclature, the ways we say things in genetics, is frankly we want an easier way of saying things rather than saying big P, big P, big P, little P, little P, little P. Okay, that's too wordy and it's too confusing. It's easy to get mixed up if you say things like that. So, of course, we have some words to describe these instead, and that would be called homozygous and heterozygous. Homozygous means you have two of the same allele. So, for example, if you have big P, uh, big P, or little p, little p, that's called homozygous. Heterozygous means two different alleles. So if you have big P, little p, that's called heterozygous. But again, we can't stop there because if you just say homozygous, you don't know if you're talking about this one or this one. So this one, the two big P's are the two dominants, we call homozygous dominant. And this one, the two little p's are the two recessives, we call homozygous recessive. And then this one is just called heterozygous. It's not heterozygous dominant or heterozygous recessive because it's one of each. So again, with genetics nomenclature, we also want to have a way of referring to how something looks versus what are its genes. And that is called phenotype versus genotype. So phenotype is something's physical appearance. Like what does it look like? Is it purple flowers or is it white flowers? That would be the phenotype. In contrast, genotype would be what are its genes? So is it homozygous dominant, heterozygous, homozygous recessive, big P, big P, big P, little P, little P, little P? That would be its genotype. And sometimes we do need to be able to differentiate these two because there are times where more than one genotype can make the same phenotype. So for example, homozygous dominant and heterozygous, two different genotypes, they create the same phenotype, purple flower color. Okay, what I need you to do for me now is if you do not already have it, please go get a pencil or pen and several pieces of paper. This is very important, so if you don't have it, pause the video now, and then unpause it when you come back. Alright, so the reason that I need you to have a piece of paper and a pencil or pen is because genetics, this chapter, and the exam we're going to cover on genetics is different from the other exams we've covered in this course. Because genetics involves problem solving. Okay, and you're going to work through genetics problems on the exam. So because of that, we're going to work through some practice genetics problems in the lecture today. I'm not just going to do them, you're going to do them with me. And kind of a tip for the exam is genetics is a little bit like math, in that if I'm a math instructor and I'm teaching you math right now, and let's say all you do is you come to the lecture, I explain a math concept to you, or I work through a math problem on the board, and then you go home, come back the next day, take your test, you're going to fail your test. Okay. In order to learn math, what you have to be doing is you have to be working through lots of practice math problems at home so you understand how to solve the math problems on the day of the exam. Okay, genetics is the same way. If you are not at home working through practice genetics problems, then you will not know how to solve the genetics problems on the day of the exam. You're going to fail the exam. So we're going to start by building up working through practice genetics problems. We're going to start with, you know, the easiest type of genetics problems and then we'll build up to more complicated ones. So for example, let's say that there's a genetics problem where I tell you that in the pea plant, capital S, the dominant is spherical, uh, the shape of the peas, and lowercase s, the recessive is wrinkled. And then I tell you of a heterozygous plant, that's big S, little s, and it's crossed with another heterozygous plant, big S, little s. And I ask you to show the Punnett square representing the cross and ask you what percentage of the offspring of the kids from that cross will be wrinkled. All right, so please right now, pause the video, okay? Please do this, don't just ignore this. Pause the video and work through this genetics problem. When you think you have the answer, unpause the video. Okay, so we have one plant that's capital S, lowercase s, a heterozygote dominant recessive. When they make their gametes, their gametes are going to be either uppercase s or lowercase s. The other plant happens to be the same thing, a heterozygote, so their gametes are going to be either uppercase s or lowercase s. Okay, then you fill in the Punnett square, big S, 
big S, big S, little s, big S, little s, little s, little s. And then the question asks you, what percentage of the offspring are going to be wrinkled? Okay, so to know what's wrinkled, you have to go back to the beginning, and it tells you that wrinkled is the recessive. Okay, so the only way to see the recessive phenotype is if you're homozygous recessive. Remember, if you're a heterozygote like this, big S, little s, you don't look wrinkled because you have the dominant, so you would look spherical. So this has two big S's, spherical, big S, little s, spherical, big S, little s, spherical, two little s's, that's going to be wrinkled. So one out of the four possible, possible progeny, so one out of four are going to be wrinkled, or 25%. Okay, so that was working through that first practice genetics problem. Now, let's try another one. Okay, this is a similar problem, but not exactly the same. The parents are not the same in the first problem. Again, pause the video, work through this. When you're done with it, unpause the video. So we have one parent that's a heterozygote, big S, little s. The other parent is homozygous recessive, so two little s's. Okay, so the possible kids they can make are big S, little s, big S, little s, little s, little s, and little s, little s. And then again, it asks you what percentage of the offspring are going to be wrinkled. Remember, wrinkled is the homozygous recessive. So that'd be two out of the total of four, or one half, or 50%. Now, something to note when you're working through practice genetics problems, please pay attention to how the question is phrased. And this is more of a math thing, not really a genetics thing, but it applies to genetics. So, for example, here, in this Punnett square, there's a 3 to 1 ratio of purple to white, dominant to recessive. So that's the ratio, 3 to 1, okay? Now, a ratio is not exactly the same as a chance or a percentage, so if I ask you what's the ratio of dominant to recessive, it's three dominant to one recessive, or a three to one ratio. If on the other hand, let's say I ask you what's the chance of it being recessive, well that's one recessive out of the total of four kids. So it's one out of four, or 25%. Okay, so just be aware whether the question is asking about the ratio or the chance or percentage. All right, so back to Mendel. When Mendel was doing his experiments and he was looking at these pea plants, he actually could not tell the genotype of the dominant pea plants. In other words, let's say he had a purple flower plant. Well, he knew the phenotype. It was purple flower color, but he didn't know the genotype because remember that purple flowered plants could either be big pea, big P, or it could be big P, little p. Remember, they look exactly the same, so he couldn't tell the difference. But let's say he wanted to know the difference. He wanted to know, is that purple flower plant a homozygous dominant, or is that purple flower plant a heterozygous? Okay, well, the way to figure that out is by doing an experiment called a test cross. A test cross is when you take an unknown dominant, so for example, a flower that's purple flower color, and you mate it with a recessive. And then after you do that mating, you look at the kids of that mating. So for example, let's say we have an unknown dominant. So we know it has a dominant phenotype, purple flower color, but we don't know if it's big P, big P, or if it's big P, little p. Okay, well, we take that dominant and we made it to recessive, the white flower color. Now, just by looking at the recessive, we do know its genotype. The only possible way for this to have the recessive phenotype is if it's homozygous recessive. It has to be two little p's, because if it had a big P, it wouldn't be white, it would be purple. 
So you take these two and you mate them to each other. And when you do that, there are two possibilities. Because this purple flower plant could be big P, big P, in which case it's gametes it's going to make is going to be either big P or big P. And the white flower plant has to be little P, little P. So it's gametes or little P, little P. Now, if this purple flower plant was homozygous dominant, when you made it to the recessive, every single kid is going to have the dominant phenotype, purple flower color, all of them. In contrast, if this purple flower plant was the heterozygote, big P, little p, its gametes it can make are either big P or little p, made it to the recessive, okay, two little p's. When you made those two together, half of the progeny of the kids are going to be the dominant phenotype purple, and half are going to be the recessive phenotype white. So half are going to be purple, and half are going to be white. So this is a test cross. You take the unknown dominant, you made it to the recessive, and you look at the kids. If every single kid is the dominant phenotype, then you know the parent had to be homozygous dominant. If half of the kids are dominant and half of the kids are recessive, then you know that parent had to be a heterozygote. The genetics experiments we've been talking about so far is what Mendel started with. He started by taking two plants that were different at one character, one gene. So for example, you had a purple flower plant and a white flower plant, but everything else was exactly the same. Like they both had green peas, they both had uh, spherical peas, they both had inflated pea pods, etc. Everything was exactly the same, except for that one character or gene that he was looking at. Okay, so that was called a monohybrid cross. Remember this prefix mono means one. But, unfortunately for you, Mendel didn't stop there. He next wanted to figure out what would happen if two different pea plants differed at two genes or characters at the same time. Okay, that's called a dihybrid cross. So this prefix di means two. Okay, so he's looking at two plants that differ in two genes at the same time. For example, let's say you have a pea plant that has yellow peas, and those yellow peas are round. The other pea plant has green peas, and those green peas are wrinkled. So this is two different genes at the same time. One gene controls pea color, yellow versus green. The other gene controls pea shape, round versus wrinkled. Okay, so that's a dihybrid cross. With a monohybrid crosses, since we had one gene, we we're working with two letters. Because remember, there's two copies of every gene. Like it was big P, big P, or big P, little P, or little P, little P. Okay, this time, since we're working with two genes, and there's two copies of each of them, we're going to be working with four letters. For example, let's say that metal started with a P plant that was uh, yellow colored peas, and yellow is the dominant. And let's say he was starting with true breeding yellow, so we would put capital Y, capital Y, okay? That's just like big P, big P for the purple flower plant that he started with. Now that yellow P also was round, and round is also the dominant, and it was true breeding for round, so we would put big R, okay, big R. Okay, so since there's two genes, you have four different letters. Two letters for the P color and two letters for the P shape. So big Y, big Y, yellow peas, big R, big R, round peas. Okay, so that's one P plant. And then he's going to mate that with another P plant. Let's say that P plant was the recessive green color. So that P plant would be little Y, little Y. And it has the recessive wrinkled peas, so that'd be a little r, little r. Okay, so that was the pea generation he started with. He started with a plant that was true breeding yellow and round and made it to a plant that was true breeding green and wrinkled. That's going to then create the F1 generation. Now, honestly, you don't need to really do a Punnett square to figure out the F1 because there's only one possible thing that these parents can make. For example, this parent over here, this parent has two capital Ys. Okay, when they make their gamete, they're going to go from diploid to haploid, so they need to pass on one of these Ys. Well, that means they're either passing on this capital Y or this capital Y. Either way, it means their kids are going to get a capital Y. Similarly, this parent has two little Ys. They have to give something to their gametes to pass on to their kids. So they're going to pass on either this little Y or this little Y. Either way, they're passing on a little Y. 
Same case for the R's. Two big R's, so they have to pass on a big R. Two little R's, so they have to pass on a little R. Okay, so that means if this P generation mates with each other, this is the only possibility that can be made in the F1. All right, let me pause again and talk briefly again about genetics nomenclature. Maybe you've noticed when I've written things like, let's say, the heterozygote uh, purple flowered plant, I always put big P, little p. Okay, technically, little p, big P would be exactly the same thing, but we just don't write it like that. Okay, to make sure everyone's writing everything in the same way to make it easier to read and keep track of, we all follow the same nomenclature, which is if you have a heterozygote, if you have a dominant and a recessive, you always put the dominant one first. You always put the capital letter first, much like you always capitalize the first letter of your sentence, never the last letter of your sentence. All right, so that's if there's one gene. Now, if there's two genes, if you notice the way I wrote it was big Y, little y, big R, little r. I did not write big Y, big R, little y, little r. Okay, again, you do not write it like that. Okay, so when there's a dominant, when there's a capital letter, you always put the capital letter first within a gene, but you keep the genes together. So first you put the Y's together, and then within the Y's, the dominant one goes first, and then you put the R's together, and then within the R's, the dominant one goes first. Okay, so that's how you write genetics nomenclature. Okay, so recall in the F1 generation, what Mendel had was big Y, little y, big R, little r. Okay, that's what we just showed you a second ago. Now again, Mendel's going to allow them to mate with each other. So that's going to mate again with a big Y, little y, big R, little r. All right. Now to solve this, you're going to do a Punnett square. However, for dihybrid crosses, when you're using two genes, you cannot use a four square Punnett square like I showed you with the other ones. Okay. So instead of doing that, what you have to do is you have to do a 16 square Punnett square. Now, the reason you have to do a 16 square Punnett square is because each parent can make four possible types of gametes. So four possible sperm cells from the father on the top, four possible egg cells from the mother on the left. Since you have four from the father, four from the mother, that makes 16 total squares to build your Punnett square. <clears throat> so recall, we're starting with, in the F1, we had big Y, little y, big R, little r. <coughs> so the first step is to figure out this parent, what are the four possible gametes they can make? Now the four possible gametes they can make, you're going to determine by a method that I can almost guarantee you have learned one of your math classes before, which is called the FOIL method. And FOIL stands for first, outer, inner, last. What we're going to do is we're going to take the first of the two different genes. So the first of the Y's and the first of the R's, that would be the F in FOIL. Okay, and that's big Y, big R. Okay, so that's the first possible gamma you can make, big Y, big R. Then the O in FOIL stands for outer. You're going to take the two outer genes, that would be big Y with little r. And that is going to be the O in foil, big Y, little r. And that's the next possible gamete that parent can make. So the I in foil stands for inner. You're going to take the two inner genes, so little y with big R. That's the I in foil. So little y with big R. And then the L in foil stands for last. And again, you're going to take the last of the two different genes, not the last two letters, like not the last, like, like not the last two R's. You're going to take the last of the, of the Y's and the last of the R's. That's the L in foil. So that's going to be a little y, little r. Okay, so that's how you foil. It stands for first, outer, inner, last. Okay, and that's how you figure out the four possible gametes that parent can make. Now recall, in this F1 generation, okay, remember they're mating with each other, so you have the big Y, little Y, 
big R little r made it to big Y little y, big R little r. So then you would take this parent and foil them. You would foil them in the same way. And because the parents happen to be the same, you're going to get the same gametes, but the parents are not always necessarily going to be the same. So make sure you foil the other parent first, big Y, big R. And I put that right here, big Y, big R. Outer, big Y, little r, big Y, little r. Inner, little Y, big R, little Y, big R. Last, little y, little r, little y, little r. Okay, so now I've foiled both parents. Now I have the gametes on the outside of this 16 square Punnett square. So the next step is just like the next step of the four square Punnett square. You're going to put inside the square what is outside of that square. Again, keep the genes together. So for example, in this square, I'm going to have big y, big Y, and big R, big R. In this square, I have big Y, big Y, and big R, little r. Okay, so you're going to fill in all 16 squares. Okay, just like that. Now, what is inside this Punnett square those are the possible genotypes of the kids from that mating. Okay, so inside this Punnett square currently is the F2 generation. However, what you're most likely to be asked about is not necessarily the genotypic ratios of the F2 from a dihybrid cross like this, but actually you're more likely to be asked about the phenotypic ratios of the F2. So the next step, what you need to do is you need to make yourself a key. For example, let's say I want to know all the pea plants that are yellow and round. Okay, well remember to be yellow, yellow is the dominant, you have to have at least one capital Y. So the way I would represent that is capital Y dash, because it could be big Y, big Y, or big Y, little Y, it doesn't matter what the second Y is. So I put a dash to represent that it means I don't care what the second Y is. And round at the same time, Round is also the dominant, so capital R dash. So what I want to do is I want to find every square that has at least one big Y and at least one big R at the same time. And what I'm going to do is whenever I find those squares, I'm going to go through and put some symbol, let's say a dot inside each of them. So this one has at least one big Y and at least one big R, so it's going to be a dot. At least one big Y and at least one big R, doesn't matter the second R is a little R, so it's going to be a dot. So I'm going to go through and find all of them that meet that classification, at least one big Y and at least one big R. I'm going to put a dot inside each of them. And when I do that, what it turns out is that out of these 16 total squares, nine of them have a dot inside them, which means the chance of them having a kid who's yellow and round is a 9 16th chance. Okay. Now let's say I want to know all the possible kids who are yellow, okay, which is big Y dash, and wrinkled. Recall wrinkled is a recessive, so the only way to be wrinkled is if you're homozygous recessive. I'm going to go through and find all those, I'm going to put a triangle into each of them. So at least one big Y and two little R's, put a triangle. Note this one does not count. It has at least one big Y, but only has one little R. It has to have two little R's to be wrinkled. So I'm going to go through and find all of those of at least one big Y and two little R's. And it turns out of the 16, there's three of them that look like that. So there's a 3 16 chance of that. Then I'm going to go through and find all of the ones that are green. Green is a recessive, so it must be two little Y's. And round, round is the dominant, so at least one capital R, big R dash. Now let's say I'm going to put a circle inside each of those, an open circle. Okay, so two little y's and at least one big r, two little y's and at least one big r, two little y's and at least one big r. So it turns out there's a 3 16th chance of that. Then let's say I want all the ones that are green, has to be two little y's, and wrinkled has to be two little r's. Let's say I go through and put a star inside those, and it turns out there's only one of those. So there's a 1 16th chance of that. Okay, so... <clears throat> That's the way you're going to solve these dihyperpunnet squares for the exam.
Okay, yes, it's going to take some time. It's going to take some effort. You're going to have to write these things out. But please write it out. Do not try to do it in your head. Please don't be lazy. Don't rush through it. Okay, first, foil the parents and write out the foiling. Then fill in all 16 squares. Then make yourself a key. Like write out the phenotypes and what their genotypes have to be. And make sure you put these dashes here because they're important. Because that way you know the difference between this one and this one. This has at least one big R. This one has to be two little R's. Then pick a symbol for each one, put a symbol on each side, inside each box, and then count up the numbers. And when Mendel did this, what he got is he got a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio of the four possible phenotypes. And this explains why he got that ratio. Now, when Mendel was actually starting the dihyper crosses, he was doing this for a reason, not just to make your life more complicated. He was doing this because he wanted to know if he has two different genes, do they have to stay inherited together or could they sort independently away from each other? In other words, if he started with a pea plant that was yellow and round and a pea plant that was green and wrinkled, did yellow always have to stay together with round and a green always has to stay together with wrinkled or could you get them separated? Could you get yellow with wrinkled and green with round? Okay, so when he did this, okay, if the two genes were linked together, if they were stuck together, then in the F2, all he could possibly get is yellow and round and green and wrinkled. But that's not what he got. What he saw is what's called the law of independent assortment. The two different genes do not have to stay together. They sort independently. So he got yellow with round and green with wrinkled when he started with it. But he also got yellow with wrinkled and green with round. That's now known as the law of independent assortment. The two genes do not have to stay together. They sort independently. But it turns out the only reason that Mendel saw independent assortment is because all seven genes he was looking at, they happen to be located on seven different chromosomes. You only see independent assortment if genes are on different chromosomes. Why? Because as we learned in the meiosis chapter, the chromosomes sort independently. Remember during metaphase one of meiosis one, when the chromosomes line up down the middle of the cell, they line up as homologous pairs. But it's completely random how they line up. This capital Y does not have to line up with this capital S. You could have the capital Y with a lowercase s. So Mendel saw independent assortment. The genes, the, the yellow and the yellow and round pea plant did not have to stay together. You could get yellow with wrinkled. He saw that because those two genes were on two different chromosomes. Now, what if you have two genes on the same chromosome. Let's say capital Y is on the same chromosome with capital A and little y is on the same chromosome with little a. All right, so for that, we're going to learn about that in the next chapter. For today, we're going to pretend every gene is on its own chromosome. Obviously, that's not true. There's thousands, there can be thousands of genes on each chromosome, but we're going to pretend every gene has its own chromosome. That's why Mendel saw independent assortment. So now what we need to do is work through and practice some dihybrid genetics crosses. On your exam, there will be genetics problems that involve dihybrid crosses. Okay, so please right now, pause the video and work through this dihybrid problem on a pencil and paper. Work through the entire thing and then unpause the video when you think you have the answers. Okay, so these are the results I got from that first dihypergenetics problem. Hopefully yours looks similar to this. Now let's move on to another practice genetics problem. Notice in this problem the two parents are not the same, but perform this problem similar to how you performed the last one. Again, pause the video now. Make sure you actually work through this genetics problem, and then we'll come back together. All right, so from that genetics problem, this is the result that I obtained. Hopefully yours looks similar to this. And this is where we're gonna be stopping for today. We've covered about half of this chapter. We're gonna cover the rest of the chapter in the next video. In the next video, we're gonna discuss, well, what are the things that Mendel did not see with genetics, at least some of the things that he did not see.